Are we ready, Lily? I'm ready whenever you are. I think okay. uh, I see participants are still logging in. Yeah, I'll give a few minutes. Well, good morning to the RMA region. Uh, my name is John Gleason, and I currently serve as the president of the Rocky Mountain ABBA region. And it's, it's my pleasure, and I'd like to thank Lalit Agarwal for uh, spending the time to share with us a very important uh, issue, and that is uh, lower carbon footprints. Um, this webinar entitled The Path to Net Zero empowered through technology and will lead being an expert in this field. I'd like to once again thank you, Lily, for spending the time to share with us this information. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, thank you, John. Uh, yeah, um, as John uh, mentioned, my name is Lalit Agarwal. I'm the Vice President of Energy Management and Sustainability at uh, Energy Cap LLC. Um, I'm in this role for about four months now. Uh, prior to this, I worked in the facilities department at University of Nebraska uh, for almost two decades. Um, so um, been through this, lived through this, and understand all the challenges that some of you all are dealing with in terms of trying to um, manage and maintain sustainability initiatives, decarbonization on uh, your own campuses. So happy to share this information. Um, before we jump into the conversation though, just a few bookkeeping uh, items. If you have questions during the session, go ahead and post them in the Q&A uh, uh, using the Q&A button that you find at the bottom of your uh, screen. At the end of the uh, webinar, this uh, recording will be made available to uh, all the registrants. And to my knowledge, we have more than 30 people registered for this uh, um, webinar. So uh, some of you who are live right now will get the opportunity to ask live questions. Those who were not able to make it due to busy schedules will at least get to watch the recording. Um, we have about 45 minutes of content that we're gonna, uh, I'm going to share with you and then probably open it up to Q&A uh, near the last 10-15 minutes. So without further ado, let's uh, jump right into this. So um, this is the high level uh, agenda for our conversation today. We're gonna just briefly talk about sustainability and decarbonization at a very high level. Now decarbonization is a subset of sustainability. So we are gonna talk about both of them sometimes interchangeably. So just keep that in mind. Uh, some of the strategies that uh, institutions are using um, and then the technology part of it is how do you use an energy and sustainability ERP to achieve your goals? So we're gonna start with that. So first thing is sustainability and decarbonization. So what is sustainability? Really sustainability is uh, our efforts to avoid the depletion of natural resources in order to maintain an ecological balance. So that's really the core of what sustainability is. We have finite amount of resources. We don't want to deplete them too fast and use it up. And at the same time, um, dis disrupt the ecological balance. And ecological balance includes what we do that goes into atmosphere as greenhouse gas. So that's the other part of the equation that we have to always remember. So this is a quick overview from uh, US greenhouse gas emissions in 2019. And uh, the pie chart shows uh, each kind of gases that we are emitting in the atmosphere. So the problem is that greenhouse gases we emit can stay in the atmosphere for a few years to thousands of years. And that's a, that's a big challenge because these gases create adverse effects. And plus we may think that, oh, it's not my problem. China is doing the emission, India is doing the emission. No, actually whatever the emissions that we create, they actually get pretty well mixed. That means that it doesn't matter where they are emitted. It will actually eventually become uh, uniform for everybody around the world. And that's just a quick metric about how much uh, uh, US emissions in 2019 uh, 
So why does it matter? Why does GHG matter? Ecosystems have always produced uh, greenhouse gases, methane from uh, livestock. It's always been there. Why does it matter? Well, it matters because uh, we have made an exponential increase in how much we are uh, putting into the atmosphere as greenhouse gases since the first industrial revolution. And it's only been accelerated as our, uh, the population of the world has grown, as technology has uh, advanced. So it's, it's, a, a, it's become much worse since then. Uh, and what does GHG do? Well, GHG increasing, uh, increasing of these gases, they trap the heat inside the ozone layers, which results in rising average global temperatures. And what does that mean? Well, it means melting glaciers, which indicates rising sea levels. So people who are living in coastal areas have a risk of more flooding or uh, permanent flooding. We have more and more frequent and more intense natural disaster. Pick up a newspaper, pick up a, a favorite uh, news feed that you may have subscribed to, and you will see this happening throughout the country, throughout the world for that matter. And then there are of course other uh, adverse impacts. The international, or sorry, not international, intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, has released a sixth assessment report. Uh, this actually came out about a month ago where they are basically identifying that we stand here in 2022 and we have choices that we can make that can lead us down the path of uh, um, worse, uh, worsening of situation or we can make better choices that can maybe move us up the uh, um, better, betterment of atmosphere. So those are the choices we can make and some of these choices are pretty simple. Um, some of it is related to forestation rather than deforestation and a lot of other areas that we will talk about uh, in a little bit. So we have uh, institutions like ourselves. So Harvard University is one example that has uh, identified that they have a short-term goal in 2026 to aggressively reduce uh, campus energy use and offset remainder by investing in off-campus projects. Long-term goal, 2050, is to be fossil fuel free. I'm sure that some of your campuses are also dealing with some goals that are either set up in conjunction with your feedback or maybe completely uh, isolated from your feedback, but somebody is making those, or if they haven't made it for your institution today, trust me, it's coming. They will be making some kind of an announcement because uh, at this time, the recruitment, new students, they are looking for these initiatives and these kind of uh, leadership from uh, our higher education institutions to make sure that uh, they are doing their part to uh, help the planet. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about some sustainability strategies uh, that we have at our disposal to do what we can for the uh, planet. So focusing purely from an energy point of view, um, we want to focus on uh, unlimited and unlimited in quotes because there's nothing unlimited. Unlimited supply or whatever resources can be renewed. So use nature to our rescue. So yeah, you can plant forest and that will help absorb the carbon dioxide from the air, but we can also use nature, which is creating all these uh, aspects of uh, uh, sources of energy for us. So you can use biomass, we can use deep water cooling, and I'll talk a little bit more about the deep water cooling. We have fuel cells, geothermal, I'll talk a little bit about geothermal also, hydropower, solar, wind. So there are so many aspects of um, uh, green energy that are out there that we can uh, use to our benefit that will help us reduce our impact in uh, uh, increasing greenhouse gases. So lake source cooling, this is an example of uh, Cornell University where they would, uh, they are located about three miles up the hill uh, in uh, Ithaca and there's Lake Cayuga down the hill uh, in the valley. So instead of uh, replacing all the chillers that were coming due for replacement, they instead went with a very, very aggressive and um, capable project that they would suck the water from the bottom of the Lake Cayuga and dump it back near the top and run it through heat exchangers that would then have a closed loop running back and forth from campus. So 38 degree water was sucked from the bottom of the lake, returned it to uh, the top of the lake at uh, 50 degrees, 55 degrees, depending on whatever the seasonality is. 
and that water then was used to pump all the way up to the up the hill to the campus and uh, no chillers needed going forward but it's not cheap it's a very expensive project it cost them about 60 million dollars to undertake this project but because of that uh, that bold vision that that vis that willingness to take that big risk they have now seen about 85% reduction in their electrical uh, consumption, which amounts to about 20 million kilowatt hours per year. And you do the math and it's really a 20 year simple payback. And actually last year was the 20th year anniversary of this uh, project. If you have not seen it in action, if you ever are in upstate New York area, highly recommend um, going and playing, paying a visit. Um, so they've basically paid it back and everything in future is going to be uh, free. So the other benefit of this is also that it eliminates refrigeration. So you, uh, refriger refrigerants that are used within the refrigeration equipment. So the chillers um, that have the refrigerant, now typically they're not consuming the refrigerant, but refrigerants can actually escape uh, through leaks or uh, improper handling and Refrigerants are actually the worst greenhouse gases because they multiply in the atmosphere. They become worse when they go up as greenhouse gases. Um, the other thing we talk about is geothermal. Now, typically the geothermal we talk about is the uh, shallow geothermal as uh, some people call it, um, or indirect use geothermal. So you may have a heat pump at your home that instead of uh, exchanging uh, heat with the air, it exchanges heat with the ground and it is definitely more efficient. But then there is also this new technology that is uh, actually not so new. Iceland has used this forever where they have these hot water, hot water geysers like uh, relatively uh, shallow warm groundwater aquifers that are present. So you can use uh, direct, ge direct use geothermal to pump hot water out of the um, ground and run it through a district, whether it's a campus or a downtown district in Iceland for that matter, actually they use that warm water to even heat homes. And then you dump it back into the uh, earth and when uh, due to the core temperature of the earth, it heats you up. So that's, that's the direct use geothermal. Then you also have deep geothermal. So you don't have that source of water available right at the uh, shallow level of the surface. Um, you can pump deep holes, maybe sometimes three or four kilometers deep, and then you pump actually water into the ground and uh, use that uh, recirculated water back to go through your campus for delivery or your district energy system. Uh, again, picking on Cornell, they are actually uh, investing in uh, deep geothermal and Princeton, I believe, is also. Again, very expensive, still yet to be proven technology, but if it works, they will never need boilers in their uh, operation going forward, and they will basically have free heating in addition to free cooling. So that that's a, a, a that's a great place to be. Uh, here's the other idea: is there is no single answer. This is another picture from uh, Cornell University, where you see they do draw some energy from power grid. They have some solar uh, PV on their campus uh, up here. Uh, they have a hydroelectric plant, so they actually even generate uh, hydroelectricity on their campus. They have the lakes or schooling that I talked about earlier. Um, they still have some CHP to generate power for Black Start and other purposes. So they're still burning some fossil fuel. But the key is that we're, not, we're never going to have a single answer that will solve the problem. So there is no single bullet. Uh, a silver bullet that will uh, make this uh, automated and it will just uh, go away. So we will have to be uh, uh, accepting of the fact that this is gonna be a combination of solutions that's gonna solve our big problem. The good thing is the industry is trending towards uh, more favorable uh, conditions. So we have the social awareness. We talked about Harvard's mandate and I'm sure that your institutions also have some mandates. The other part of it is technology is trending in a more favorable way also. Cost of renewals, both material and labor is coming down. Renewable technologies effectiveness is uh, improving significantly. In fact, just uh, I think it was two months ago, I was reading an article on um, that some scientists at Stanford University have actually figured out how to generate solar energy at night. 
Yep, you heard me right, solar energy at night. And they're using the energy exchange between the cold night and the um, vacuum in the space to be able to do that. Now, the amount of electricity that is getting generated at night is minuscule compared to the daytime effectiveness when it comes to the sun shining brightly, but at least it's something um, and combined together, uh, it, it can make an impact. But even more than that, it's great to have these great minds thinking and figuring out newer ways to get more out of our resources. So that's great. And what's the result of that? The result is that the grid is getting greener. So the more and more renewable technologies are getting cheaper, more grid operators are willing to uh, incorporate them as part of their uh, solution. And then we also have the smart technology adoption. I think John's gonna talk about uh, Campus of the Future webinar that he's gonna host for the RMA membership in uh, some time. And that's, that's part of it is smart sensors are coming down in the cost. And those smart sensors are getting a lot more out of the same energy that we are putting into our building. So the 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 squeeze is worth uh, the juice is worth the squeeze. So that that's also a really good thing that we have uh, going for us. Um, um, next, uh, we are going to talk about this uh, last kilowatt hour. Uh, so the last kilowatt is uh, also dependent on availability of renewal. So you all know wind doesn't always blow, sun is not shining at night, and the storage of technology is not there yet. So the battery and other energy storage um, at an industrial grade, um, they're still uh, very nascent technology. Uh, and at scale, they are not very easily uh, available. But the key is don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So if you have capabilities of reducing your fossil fuel usage, go ahead and do that. If you cannot get to 100% carbon neutral, that's okay. Even if you get to 98% carbon neutral, that's 98% less greenhouse gas that we are putting in the atmosphere. And if all of us start doing that, we would be much better off. So one of the strategies that we use is improving our energy efficiency. So when you have an, a, a, any piece of equipment that's reaching end of life, make sure that the replacement equipment that you're using is not just a drop-in replacement, but it incorporates more modern energy efficient alternatives. So don't just um, replace it one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, make sure you do proper maintenance. That, that goes a long ways. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. When, when I say that uh, improper maintenance wastes a lot of energy. If you have your coils plugged up in your air handlers, they're not gonna be able to do proper heat transfer between the chill water or the refrigerant that you have with air. So uh, you lose, uh, your, you're wasting more energy without proper maintenance that you would gain back if you were to just do that. Uh, space management is another challenge that a lot of campuses have. Uh, some of you may have this also where evening classes, for example, are spread across 15 buildings and it's less than 10% of the building that's used for that. Work with your uh, registrar office, try to figure out a way to better manage your space, consolidate your uh, um, students in one building so you can actually turn off the heating and cooling in other buildings. And then definitely leverage smart building technology. So there's so many smart building technologies that you have out there that you can um, use that will help you leverage that uh, information. Um, the other one uh, is energy conservation. The kilowatt that you did not use is the kilowatt you never have to produce, the kilowatt you never have to distribute. So the less you use, the better off you are. Turn it off when you're not using it. So that's the best way to uh, reduce your energy consumption. Measure so you can manage. So if you have tools to measure what you're using in terms of energy, you will have a better, uh, better opportunity to manage it rather than uh, it just getting used and uh, nobody's seeing the difference. But that measurement should not just be a measurement. Based on that measurement, you should see, hey, this building suddenly increased its usage by 20%. What's going on? Let's do an energy audit. And don't let that energy audit sit on your shelf and collect dust. Convert that audit recommendation into energy projects so you can actually take uh, action towards that and reduce your energy further. 
engage your occupants. So make them part of the solution. So if you have students on campus that are always asking for, hey, we need to do better for sustainability, engage them, make them part of your solution rather than them being uh, squeaky wheels on your campus. So do all that. Now we are gonna switch into the measure and manage and how you can uh, do the management of energy through an energy and sustainability ERP to achieve your goals. So it will be more now the technology part of the equation. So any energy and sustainability ERP system will help you track and tell your sustainability uh, story. So measure so you can manage, identify high energy users so you can target the right buildings for energy audits track your energy projects, and then engage others with dashboards. So we'll start with measures that you can manage. First things first, 40% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings. And according to the climate group, if we leave that unchecked, they are set to double by 2050. So the built environment has a big impact on the planet's energy consumption. If you look at data availability from all of these sources that contribute to sustainability, utility energy data and water are very ubiquitous and they're relatively easy to measure because we have already created metering and we've already gotten utility bills and other things that go with that. So start with measuring what you're using. So accurate and data co complete utility data when captured accurately, you can do audits to catch any issues and then you re use reports to find any missing or duplicate data. So there are ways that you can capture that information. You can use uh, your utility bills to enter that into a, a ERP system. You can do any imports or you can do some kind of automated uh, capture of information. Once you have that information, make sure that you are keeping an eye on it. If something is going significantly higher, both in cost or usage, you may want to flag them. So create automated flags that will uh, indicate to you, hey, something is going up or down in usage. So uh, make sure you do that. Then you identify high energy users and outliers. So here's a quick screenshot on how uh, one of the system can basically rank what your energy use intensity is for all the buildings on your campus. So now you can take a look at the Woodrow Wilson Center and you can go after it and figure out what's going on, maybe do a full weather audit, uh, a full energy audit. And oh, by the way, some of, some of this information can be weather normalized, so it's not taking weather into consideration, it's just uh, normalizing that against heating degree days and cooling degree days. And maybe Woodrow Wilson Center is a known um, issue because it's a science building, it takes 100% fresh air, whatever the case may be. So you can remove that out of your list and go after Stewart Transportation Center if that's the next thing you're going after. So you have the ability to create um, your own ways of visualizing the data. That way you can actually target what the next step should be in your uh, toolbox. Uh, another way that you can identify is by putting the EUI on the X axis and the total cost on the Y axis and then anything that is on the top right. And again, in this case, uh, you see Woodrow Wilson Center pops out because sometimes you may have a building there where the energy use is relatively high per square foot, but it's a tiny building. If it's a 2000 square foot building and it's using uh, 400 EUI, yes, it is important to look at it, but you're not gonna make a big impact on looking at it. But when you have a large energy user with really high costs, now even saving 1% uh, would save you $2,000 in this case, for example. So. That's the kind of uh, opportunities you would get with an energy ERP system to be able to visualize the information so you can actually easily target them. Um, another uh, quick way of uh, visualizing them is not just using those two things, but you can also use building use per area, meaning how many KBTUs I'm using per square foot. We already saw that. We can look at it from a cost perspective, how much uh, we are paying in terms of dollars for uh, per square foot for these buildings. So you can have those rankings. You can also look at it from uh, why am I paying a lot of uh, money to one particular vendor versus another vendor. So you can have a combination of these dashboards that will help you make those decisions on to which one do you want to spend investigation time on. 
we all don't have unlimited resources in terms of our energy specialists. We don't have unlimited dollars that we can hire consultants to come in and uh, take a look at uh, our facilities. So these systems allow you to target where you're gonna go next uh, to investigate that. Here's a, another just view of uh, the bigger the box, the more important the building for you to go look for. The other thing you want to do is once you have uh, taken that next step where you're, you've figured out which building you're gonna target, you've gone through an audit process and the audit has come back with some recommendation. Now you go figure out, you want to um, hire somebody to uh, take care of them as an energy project. You want to be able to track them. You want to be able to track them you know, holistically where you're saying, hey, these are the energy projects that we are engaging in. What was the start date? What was the completion date? How much did we spend? And what are we expecting from an uh, annual savings point of view in terms of dollar and in also in terms of energy use? And so you document all of that. So someday when somebody comes to you and say, hey, what have you done for our energy use? You, you have a great story you can share with them. And this is just another uh, screen from uh, more details as to what you can do uh, in these kind of systems. The last part I'm gonna uh, talk about is engaging stakeholders. So you don't have to do this alone. You should be engaging all your stakeholders in uh, making sure that they are part of the solution rather than just uh, being the squeaky wheel, as I said earlier. So here's where you can engage them through technology again, creating public dashboards. Here is an example. So I told you earlier when I introduced myself, I uh, spent two decades working at University of Nebraska uh, before my new role here. Um, so this is where uh, University of Nebraska created this public dashboard where uh, it was actually embedded right into their sustainability website. And here, anybody from general public can go in and look at how any uh, given building is uh, doing in terms of its energy consumption. Um, it had all sorts of details. So what is the carbon footprint? What is the yearly use com compar uh, comparison based on different types of utilities year to date 2022? What is the monthly trend? And so on and so forth. You can, you can do a lot of things uh, to, to get public, to get engaged with you. In fact, in some cases, University of Nebraska even chose to not just publish this on our sustainability website, but on the building information kiosks. So, so students are walking through the most heavily trafficked area. They would have screens that showed what are the schedules for the classrooms, what are the uh, events going on in the building. But the, one of the rotating uh, pieces of information was the energy dashboard. And that got more attention because now you're picking uh, their attention of the students and faculty and staff while they are walking to their natural course of the day rather than having to go pull up a website and look at it, which is more of an active uh, thing they had to do. Here's another example, City of Philadelphia. Uh, they do a very good job of engaging their stakeholders through public dashboards. They publish a lot of information on their uh, overall municipal energy use. And then you can, uh, if you are a citizen of uh, city of Philadelphia, you can drill down and look at uh, individual buildings. Um, they also have uh, information about each type of uh, usage like electrical consumption, heating consumption, how much of that was renewable, uh, how much greenhouse gas, and they've created targets uh, in addition to having the current consumption. So they have the comparison year, they have what progress they have made, and they also have a goal that they have defined that allows them to demonstrate to their stakeholders, which is the citizens of Philadelphia, that they are actually on track. They're doing what they need to do. They have these messages on the right side you see on what the current progress is and they, they create a story around what they're trying to share with their stakeholders. So that gets you even more engagement from your uh, stakeholders and it makes it easier for you to do what you're doing. So accurate measurement is very important, of course, when you're trying to push this information. And uh, sometimes uh, you also have to uh, figure out uh, how to allocate energy consumption. I'm sure that uh, some of your campuses have the uh, situation where there is one meter serving multiple buildings or uh, vice versa. So 
you need to make sure that you are able to allocate the energy used to the right lowest common denominator, the right building that you have on your campus. But in addition to allocating that consumption, you also want to convert that consumption into uh, how much greenhouse gas that that particular energy consumption uh, led to. So if you look at it from a, how do you calculate it? You have to first have the standard GHG emission factor. So these are published by EPA through eGrid. So you find that, but if you have a specific situation because of a deregulated environment and you're getting energy from a different source, not through uh, your local electricity provider, or you have your own central utility plant, you can create your own custom GAG factors. And then when you have your meters, you assign those factors to your meters. Once you have that, any new bills or meter readings that come into the system, it automatically becomes uh, what, how much GAG was emitted because of that energy consumption. And then you can convert those uh, emitted gases into CO2 equivalent for benchmarking purposes. And you want to make sure that you're using systems that make this completely automatic. You don't want to even touch it. All your responsibility is making sure that you're getting the utility bills in if they are vendor provided. If you have your own uh, metering uh, infrastructure that you're making sure that they are calibrated and you're bringing in accurate data, uh, everything else is fully automated for you. So again, just to uh, remind ourselves, we have utility energy data and water that are more ubiquitous and easy to measure. But if you come down the continuum a little bit, you still have interval energy data. You have waste management information, you have transportation of people and goods. So you don't have to stop at energy. You don't have to stop at water. You don't have to stop at your utilities. You can actually look at um, the other 60%. So we talked how 40% of your energy comes from energy usage, but there are so many other um, areas that uh, are part of sustainability mix. Uh, whether you are looking at different types of water from fire protection to irrigation to reclaimed water, or you have these miles driven. So if you have scope one of uh, uh, sustainability where you want to track uh, how many miles are driven by your fleet uh, that you own on your campus, or if you want to go to a further level where you have scope three um, miles driven by uh, employees coming to your campus, or miles flown for conferences and other events, you can ca capture all of that information in any good ERP. That is uh, the end of uh, my prepared comments. So I will um, take any question and answers that you may have um, on the screen here. Don't all speak at once. Well, Lee, I have a question. Yeah. The, the facility uh, that was using that heat exchanger from the lake. Yeah. Has there been any uh, discussions about times of drought and environmental impacts that would, that would affect that system? That's a great question, John. Um, actually, before Cornell jumped into that project, they, uh, they spent about two years working with not just that issue, but also issues about uh, the, the life inside the lake itself, so fisheries and other departments. They had to work with a lot of environmental agencies to confirm that their operation is not gonna add to any impact on the lake itself. Um, I'm not privy to the details of uh, those conversations because that was between the New York State agencies and, uh, um, and the Cornell University staff, but they, they satisfied a lot of those concerns by hosting town halls, by uh, providing answers to the governmental agencies that were uh, responsible for overseeing that project. Um, my assumption is since uh, all of those, uh, since the system exists and has existed for 20 years, uh, they must have satisfied those uh, concerns and they're in a place now. A lot of those projects, uh, uh, 
I should have mentioned this, whether it was the direct geothermal I mentioned or the lake source cooling, they're very location dependent. When I was at Nebraska, when I first learned about this Cornell project, I was like, hey, can we do that? Well, no, we can't because we don't have a lake that always is at 38 to 40 degrees at the bottom of the lake. We don't have one in nearby geography that would allow us to do that. Even if you look at, for example, solar, uh, solar is very popular in Arizona and uh, further west than it is in upstate New York because the sun doesn't shine as often in upstate New York. So their solar index, the solar output is very, very low compared to what you would find in the desert southwest or uh, in other areas. And sometimes it's the geography, sometimes it's also the policies. So California, for example, does not have any coal-fired plants anymore because the state made that determination a long time ago to make sure that uh, that didn't happen. The other thing uh, we have is uh, we have uh, um, the institutional mandates that make it a certain requirement for you to engage in a certain kind of action. So it just gets a little tricky. And the, the point is that we don't have to have um, a single answer just because it worked for somebody, it's gonna work for us. I, we don't have uh, easy access to hot water geysers everywhere in the country either. So we're not gonna be able to do uh, natural geothermal or deep geothermal very easily everywhere. So the goal is you do what you can and you make that contribution to the planet. I, I, think, it's, I think it's critical for us as facilities managers to really understand the direction that we're going with global awareness and the alternatives that we have in alternative energy and to understand those systems and their maintainability. So I, I, I would like to, as, we've, as we move forward with these types of webinars is to bridge that gap between what, all, what are the alternatives uh -huh. and what does it look like to maintain that equipment? Right, no, that's definitely fair. And a great example was, uh, again, at Nebraska in my previous job, I wanted to put uh, solar uh, everywhere on campus. Well, the problem is, and again, I say, it, I use the word problem. It's, it's a good problem to have. Electricity is so cheap in Nebraska that no matter what kind of project you put out for solar, because solar panels are about 25, 30 years life cycle, the payback was 60 years. And it, it just doesn't pencil. So just purely on economic cost, it doesn't. Now, before I left, I was trying to uh, figure out the societal cost and add that to uh, our fossil fuel cost. So we've all heard the term solar, uh, carbon tax. If there was a fair carbon tax added to my cost of fossil fuel based energy, then that number would match. If I were able to figure out what is my loss of recruitment by not having solar on campus and add that cost to my current fuel cost, then it would match up. But currently based on pure economics, it doesn't. Um, I see a question in the chat. Uh, you mentioned material and labor costs are coming down. However, we heard that solar panels are becoming scarce because of fair trade issues. Additionally, other procurement issues have increased material cost. Also, COVID culture has a big impact on labor resources. Could you share how these associated labor and material costs might be differently affected? So my answer to that would be that there are always gonna be temporary blips in what we are seeing in terms of what the market is doing. But if you look at a bigger uh, view, a longer term view, the costs have come down. Yes, because of the weird situation we have found ourselves in the last two, uh, two years plus now, um, there are gonna be uh, imbalances in the industry, uh, but eventually my hope is that they will uh, start trending downwards again. Um, at least that's my hope. Great question. Any other questions uh, from the audience? I had a question, Lily. Yeah. Um, so CU Boulder has several different um, solar arrays around campus um, and all built by different vendors. So the dashboards that we have are, we have 
you know, all different dashboards. I'm wondering if you know of, or if Energy Cap has a solution for one consolidated dashboard? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, you can use uh, your current license that you have for Energy Cap to pull all that data in and have it all shown in a single dashboard. Absolutely, you can do that. Um, and and I, again, I I work for Energy Cap, so I'm just speaking on uh, their behalf. But any good energy sustainability ERP system uh, software platform should be able to do that for uh, anybody. I I know for a fact that uh, Energy Cap can do that. Great questions. Other questions. Lily, to your knowledge, is there discussions around facility condition indexes for our building portfolios in that if we look at the energy consumption of this building now in that light, would that raise that FCI to the point where it might be worth taking a look at it in a different lens? Yeah, I mean, that, that's definitely something that we should look at because sometimes we have so many instruments available at our disposal as facility managers. We have EUI as an index and a, and a metric that we track. We have FCI as an index and a metric that we track. We have so many others, but unfortunately, uh, and some of you may not be guilty of this, but I was when I was in my role at Nebraska, I would just focus on that and just look at that we have to broaden our scope. So to your point, John, one thing we did um, uh, when I was at Nebraska was we actually plotted EUI on uh, actually on the x-axis and FCI on the y-axis, and then you do a scatter plot. Then anything that is on the top right, FCI is high and EUI is high, meaning that we have to put a lot of investment in that building to make its energy uh, come down and to make so it's a, it's a high energy user and it needs a lot of investment. And at that time, instead of just saying, hey, I need a lot of money, you need to have that conversation. Is that building even needed right now? How well is it used? What is the programmatic use for that building? Should there be a conversation about decommissioning buildings instead of just putting more money into the money pit? So very astute observation. We definitely have to have those conversations. Sometimes those are very hard conversations because professors and researchers are very attached to their buildings that they are used to uh, going in for the last two, three, four decades. And uh, they, they consider them their second home. And, but that, that is very important to have that conversation because those things don't come free. Um, additionally, if you have other metrics that you're tracking, so space utilization is another metric that uh, facilities managers are starting to track more and more. You need to take all two or three of these metrics and create a two-dimensional or three-dimensional view of figuring out whether a building really should be continued to maintain, should get investment for further maintenance, or should be considered a candidate for uh, decommissioning. Um, and start the conversation there. Um, maybe the answer would be, yeah, we still need to keep that building for uh, historic purposes or whatever the other reason may be. And then you come up with strategic ways you can improve its energy use intensity or you can use uh, uh, dollars to improve its facilities condition also. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just realized that I did not put my uh, email address on the screen. Um, but John has my email. So if anybody uh, thinks of another question after we uh, complete this call and wants to send me a quick note, happy to engage and uh, connect with you and go from there. So if we don't have any other questions, uh, John, I'll turn it back to you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, just one follow up, Lily. Yeah. What's driving the so right now, uh, buildings generate 40% of our annual uh, GHGs. What's driving the 80% as we move forward in this pursuit and awareness of, 
of our carbon footprints. What's driving it to an 80% factor? Yeah, the other 60% is actually coming from transportation, industrialization. So it's not just buildings, but uh, manufacturing and other areas and transportation is one of the big ones too. So okay. airlines and um, ground or uh, water or air tra transportation, all three of them combined. Mm -hmm. And United Airlines, for example, is working on uh, sustainable aviation fuel that uh, uh, hopefully will be 80% less GHG than the current jet fuel. So there is definitely hope that um, those efforts will go towards betterment of the planet. We've all heard of Tesla's and the Chevy Volts that are already doing that. And because of those impetuses, a lot of other uh, manufacturers are also moving towards uh, electric vehicles. So a combination of things are definitely at play to make an impact in every single aspect of our lives. So this webinar and Lalit, your participation uh, is, is why ABBA and the regions are so critical in equipping us to do what we do, to bring awareness, solutions, alternatives as we navigate the future as facilities managers. Uh, I, I, I want to thank you in that vein, Lalit, for bringing that to our region and this community. And as we, as we move forward in the next 12 months, we're going to really attempt to have um, a webinar every other month. And we're going to keep it in the theme of what does facilities management look like as we move forward through smart building technologies and how students of the future are gonna interact within the spaces and how we as facilities managers are gonna maintain that equipment. Can we, can we both incorporate that type of technology and at the same time design our buildings for sustainability and longevity? Those are really valuable questions to ask. And once again, this is why RMA, APA, the regions is so critical to what we do because we have the resources that we just demonstrated in this webinar. So uh, thank you, Lily, and thank you, panel, for helping to facilitate this very important topic. Basically, how are we going to save our planet? And uh, so if there's, if there's any more questions, I, I don't know if there is or not, but this would be the time to ask them before we close out. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'm very passionate about this uh, topic as it may have come across in my tone and my demeanor. Uh, happy to engage in any shape, way or form in future. Thank you. Lily. Have a good weekend, everyone.